Ladies and gentlemen, I call this joint hearing of the Subcommittee on Readiness and Sea Power and Projection Forces of the House Armed Services Committee to order. I'm pleased to welcome members of the Sea Power and Projection Forces and the Readiness Subcommittees to the hearing today for an unclassified session on the current state of U.S. Transportation Command. I'd especially like to thank Congressman Rob Whitman, Chairman of the Sea Power and Projection Subcommittee, and Congressman Joe Courtney, the ranking member of the Sea Power and Projection Forces Subcommittee, joining us today in our effort to better understand the topic. This hearing follows a series of hearings and briefings highlighting the individual readiness challenges of each military service, which further confirms that our services are indeed in a readiness crisis. The cornerstone of the U.S. military is its service members. Underpinning their success is the ability of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines to go where they are needed and to have fully operational equipment ready to be used. While I firmly believe the United States military remains the world's best, I'm concerned about shortfalls in readiness and the trend lines that we see. U.S. Transportation Command enables our military to deliver an immediate and powerful force against U.S. adversaries anywhere in the globe through airlift, air refueling, and our strategic sea lift. As members of these subcommittees know, U.S. Transportation Command will always answer the nation's call, but there are challenges that demand our attention today to ensure the readiness of our military. I reiterate my belief that the first responsibility of the federal government is to provide for the security of its citizens, to accomplish for citizens what they cannot do for themselves. Therefore, it's our responsibility as members of these subcommittees to continue to better understand the readiness and force structure situation of the United States Transportation Command, to understand where we continue to take risk and understand where more attention is needed. I'd like to welcome our distinguished witness, who we are honored to have with us today, General Darren W. McHugh, McDew, and U.S. Air Force, Commander, U.S. United States Transportation Command. And I'd do like to point out that uh, Congressman Whitman and I were both commenting just now a distinguished graduate of the Virginia Military Institute of Lexington, Virginia. I thank you for testifying today and look forward to your thoughts and insights as you highlight the current state of the U.S. Transportation Command. I'd like to now turn to the ranking member of the Sea Power and Projections Force Subcommittee, also ranking in as member of the Readiness Subcommittee, Congressman Joe Courtney, for any remarks you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you again to my colleague from uh, Virginia, uh, uh, Mr. Whitman, for uh, uh, coordinating this joint hearing uh, this morning. It's a good, efficient way to get his, you know, the message out to a, as large a group of us as possible. Um, and uh, I think this hearing offers an important opportunity for our two panels to receive a timely update on the readiness status of the U.S. Transportation Command, which plays a critical but too often overlooked role in our airlift and sea lift capabilities. Getting the people, supplies, and equipment to the locations they are needed when they are needed is one of the foundational pieces of our nation's ability to project power around the globe. Under Transcom, the mix of organic military assets and commercial partners makes a powerful combination that must be carefully managed and sustained. And while I believe that Transcom remains ready today to fill, fulfill its important mission, I'm concerned about some of the longer-term challenges it will face without action by Congress. For example, while the emerging buildup of our Navy fleet has received significant attention in the recent months, the state of our sea lift capabilities is just as important. Many of the sea lift ships that reside in the fleet today are the result of congressional urging and funding due to insufficient prioritization and planning within the executive branch. As the Navy potentially embarks on an increased shipbuilding initiative for combatants to support the new FSA, it is just as critical that our sea lift requirements are not once again sidelined. America's ready reserve fleet and the vessels within the maritime security program are strategic and irreplaceable national assets. And like other strategic assets, we must uh, ensure that we do all we can to maintain, support, and replace the ships that comprise them. I am deeply concerned, however, that we have not paid enough attention as a nation to the health and viability of our pool of vessels or the mariner pipeline needed to crew them. As we look at addressing some of the more urgent near-term needs facing our sea lift capability, it is important as well to have a clear and long-term path towards fully recapitalizing our sea lift fleet and the mariners needed to, to man them. 
In the near term, I believe we need to take action to ensure that the MSP has the resources and support it needs. Chairman Whitman and I have teamed up to lead a bipartisan letter of more than 50 other members to the House Appropriators, urging them to fully fund the Maritime Security Program for fiscal year 2018. The Maritime Security Program provides an extremely cost-effective means of ensuring critical sea lift capability during times of crisis and deserves strong support as we consider the budget in the months ahead. I'm also proud that the Sea Power Subcommittee has led the way to assure that we continue to have the ability to train the next generation of mariners that will support our sea lift needs. Last year, we authorized the construction of a national security multi-mission vessel that will replace the aging fleet of training ships allocated to our state maritime academies. Together, these institutions provide the majority of our nation's trained mariners, and this uh, program is key to ensuring that we protect and grow this vital pipeline. Equally important to America's ability to deliver the, the fight is our strategic airlift capacity. This sub subcommittee has strongly supported the recapitalization of key assets like the KC-46A tankers, while also backing cost-effective modernization efforts of other platforms like the C-130H fleet and the C-5Ms. While each service must balance competing efforts to restore readiness, as we have heard during the State of the Air Force hearing last week, continued modernization efforts in our C-130H fleet must be prioritized as a relatively inexpensive means of maintaining critical uh, capacity. And uh, we heard a shout out for uh, Virginia a few minutes ago. Just want to recognize that the C-130H uh, airlift wing of the Connecticut Flying Yankees, I say that grudgingly as a Red Sox fan, um, are deployed right now overseas. Uh, supporting uh, the important mission in the Middle East. And um, again, that was a lot of hard work. I want to thank the Air Force and the Air Force uh, Reserves for uh, uh, basically getting that flying mission uh, back in, in, uh, in action again. And uh, again, I want to thank uh, the General for being here today and, uh, and again, salute his outstanding service to our nation. And with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman Courtney, and thank you for being dual-headed today. Uh, serving as uh, also the ranking member of the Readiness, readiness Subcommittee, Congresswoman Madeline Badayo, I know would want to be here today, uh, but she's uh, uh, back in Guam, the beautiful territory of Guam, uh, to provide uh, a presentation on the, uh, her annual presentation on uh, service in Congress to uh, the people of Guam. And uh, we know of her great affection uh, for uh, the beautiful territory of Guam. I, I now turn to the gentleman from Virginia and chairman of the Sea Power and Projection Forces Subcommittee, Congressman Rob Whitman, for any opening remarks that he may have. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, General McDo. Welcome. Uh, thanks so much for all of your time and effort on this extraordinarily important issue and in deference to that great school there in Lexington, go Cadets. Here, 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 here. <laughs> I also want to thank Chairman Wilson for offering to have this joint subcommittee hearing today, and I believe that there are a number of overlapping issues with the Readiness Subcommittee, and I look forward to working with the distinguished gentleman from South Carolina to make sure we move these issues forward in this year's NDAA markup process. General McDo, as you know, we are a seafaring nation, and this was the vision of our founding fathers when they commissioned the U.S. Navy in 1775, and our seafaring nature is now the bedrock of our economy. Today, merchant ships carry around 90% of everything, with that total amount having more than tripled since 1970. Unfortunately, our national security, uh, unfortunately for our national security, this seaborne trade is being increasingly outsourced to other nations and our own merchant fleet is in rapid decline. Between the years 2000 and 2014, our U.S. commercial fleet has shrunk from 282 vessels to 179 vessels, a reduction of almost 40 percent. This decline in our commercial fleet increasingly represents a national security challenge because the mariners that support our commercial sector will be used extensively by the U.S. Transportation Command during times of war or mobilization. The Maritime Administration has indicated that our commercial sector does not have sufficient mariners to sustain a prolonged mobilization of our ready reserve forces. Our nation cannot presume that a foreign-owned maritime sea lift component will be available during times of conflict to deploy into contested waters. Our nation needs U.S. mariners on U.S. flagged ships. As our strategic airlift capabilities, today we depend on a much smaller fleet to move cargo, personnel, and to medevac the wounded from more remote battlefields than during the Desert Storm era. 
Even with the larger desert storm force, a 1993 RAND study found that more than 60% of our troops and 23% of the cargo airlifted in or out of the theater went by the private sector. In future major theater wars, the Civil Reserve airlift fleet may be asked to absorb even more of the demands for cargo and troop movements. I am concerned that outdated planning assumptions need to be reviewed. The new administration has made it clear that it wants to increase Army and Marine Corps force structure. However, at the same time, areas of the globe are becoming less permissive for civilian aviation operations to deliver these additional soldiers and Marines to their areas of operation. I believe Transcom should thoughtfully consider how to best increase strategic airlift capacity and its ability to operate in contested environments around the globe. I thank Chairman Wilson for working within the Sea Power and Subcommittee Projection Forces Subcommittee on this important issue, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Congressman Rob Whitman of Virginia. We now begin with the opening statement from General McDo. We look forward to your testimony today. Good morning, uh, Chairman Wilson and uh, Whitman, Ranking Member Courtney, and distinguished members of uh, both subcommittees. Uh, it is an honor, and I'm nearly giddy this morning, to have the privilege to be here with you today, representing the fine men and women of the United States Transportation Command. Uh, I thank you for your continued support of our dedicated professionals who are all working together to provide our nation with a broad range of strategic capabilities and options. I also want to emphasize the vital role that you mentioned that our commercial industry, who I call our fourth component, plays in our success. As I appear before you today, I can say confidently that your United States Transportation Command stands ready to deliver our nation's objectives anywhere and anytime. We do this in two ways. We can provide an immediate force tonight through the use of our airlift and air refueling fleets. And we can provide that decisive force when needed through the use of our strategic sea lift and surface assets. You see evidence of this every single time you read or watch the news. When North Korea increased its provocation of our Pacific allies, America responded with assistance. U.S. Transcom delivered that assistance in the form of missile defense systems, personnel, and support equipment flying 3,000 miles within a matter of hours. When you read about America's brigade combat teams rolling through Europe, it was U.S. Transcom's ability to provide a decisive force to reassure our European allies. When America needed B-2 stealth bombers to fly 11,000 miles from Missouri to Libya and back to deliver over 100 precision weapons, our air refuelers got them there. From national disasters to epidemics to acts of war, the men and women of U.S. Transcom are standing ready to deliver this nation's aid, assistance, and hope to a world in need. These missions must ex execute seamlessly and without fail. All the while, these great professionals quietly manage a myriad of daily tasks around the globe which most Americans will never hear or read about. It takes, I believe, great diligence, skill, and innovation to provide that kind of readiness for America. And since 1987, nearly 30 years now, the men and women of U.S. Transcom have never let this nation down. I am proud to serve next to them, and I say with confidence that our organization is ready to respond when our nation calls. Now, I have great confidence, but my confidence comes, however, it's not without concern. The environment we operate in today is increasingly complex, and we expect future adversaries will be more versatile and more dynamic, forcing us to adapt, change, and evolve. Furthermore, as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Joe Dunford, laid out in his vision for our future, we are viewing potential adversaries through a trans-regional, multi-domain, and multifunctional lens. Properly understanding the potential threats from a China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, as well as worldwide global violent extremists in the global context is of utmost concern. And it is a concern for our national security. In each of these scenarios, I believe, logistics plays a critical but often overlooked role. Today, U.S. Transcom is critically examining how we execute our logistics mission in the contested environments of the future, a space we haven't had to operate in, at least logistically, for a very, very long time. We are exercising in wargaming scenarios, forcing planners to account for transportation's vital role, and 
potential loss. Earlier this year, U.S. Transcom held its first ever contested environment war game, imagining a scenario where we didn't, hard to believe, dominate the skies or own every line of communication. This war game uncovered a surprising amount of lessons learned, which we've already started absorbing into our tactics, techniques, and procedures accordingly. I'm also concerned about our national strategic sea lift capability. A delay in recapitalizing our military sea lift fleet creates risk in our ability to deploy forces across the globe. These concerns are compounded further by merchant mariner shortages and the reduction of U.S. flagged vessels. Today, our resources make us capable of meeting today's logistics needs. However, if we don't take action soon, many of our military sea lift command vessels will begin to age out by 2026. A significant portion of the DOD's wartime cargo capability moves on these ships. My final concern is, is one that runs throughout our operations and no doubt concerns us all, the cyber threat. We aren't the only government agency to face these threats, but U.S. Transcom has a unique problem set. Unlike other combatant commands, commercial industry plays a vital role in how we accomplish our mission. The DOD's information network is relatively secure, but how do we guarantee the security of military data on commercial systems? In short, we operate in an ambiguous seam between DOD and DHS. Our mission includes both .mil and .com domains. We are accelerating several initiatives and also are thinking to help try to close that gap between DOD and DHS. Also, before I conclude, I'd like to extend my gratitude to Ms. Vicki Plunkett, a member of the Readiness Subcommittee professional staff for her dedication and her work with U.S. Transcom. To our nation's benefit, she has always asked the tough questions, and she knew how to match Congress's intent to the capabilities Transcom delivers. We thank her for all she has done for the nation and wish her the very best in retirement. Um, thank you again, Chairman Wilson and Whitman and Ranking Member Courtney and members of the subcommittees for inviting me, interesting, inviting me to speak to you today. I respectfully request my written testimony be submitted for the record, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. General, thank you very much. And we've uh, just been notified that we may be having votes uh, around 10. And so uh, fortunately, we have Margaret Dean here who's going to maintain strict five-minute rule, uh, <laughs> beginning with me. And so it, it shall begin. And, um, and I, um, I'm really grateful, again, uh, that you're here. And, uh, and the challenges that you've indicated uh, that become even more gruesome as you approach 2026. Um, uh, but uh, additionally, uh, in, in line with that, every week we read about potential adversaries challenging our freedom of na navigation by air or sea in areas such as the South China Sea, Straits of Hormuz, and the Baltic Sea. Is Transcom, pre Transcom prepared to deliver combat capability in these potentially contested areas? Chairman, this is a, a new challenge for us. For 70 years, we've had domain dominance. We haven't been challenged in, in any domain for as long as I can remember in my military service and long before that. So it is definitely something we are now coming to grips with. Our contested environment war game that we had recently uh, that had 64 different agencies, part of it, every COCOM, everybody in the logistics community, some commercial partners and others, has brought us to the realization that we can't always assure that everything we send in a direction will make it. We can't always be sure that we'll have the clear lines of communication that we need. We haven't, to this point, planned for any losses in logistics. It's 100% success, and 100% of the things get there at 100% of the time. I don't think that's a valuable proposition going forward to think that way. So we're changing the way we think, and we're putting it into every exercise to try to get at it differently. Thank you very much for being uh, so proactive. Uh, and you mentioned, of course, cyber as a threat. Uh, with the threats increasing, are they impacting readiness? Are there any threats or challenges in this domain that are unique to Transcom and may not be currently addressed by DOD or the interagency? If so, what is being done to ensure operational security in the cyber realm? Well, Chairman, we, we spent about a year ago, we started down a path of discovery on cyber. Uh, we were not ready to have this kind of dialogue a year ago when I sat in front of you. I was understanding that the threat was approaching, but I didn't understand the depth of the, of the problem. We've had three cyber roundtables over the last 18 months. 
And in those cyber roundtables, we've had academia, we've had uh, business leaders, we've had hackers join us to take us from cyber awareness to cyber knowledge. And, and now we understand how nervous we should be in this domain. The seam that exists between DOD and DHS um, is a real seam for us. Because we have 90% of my activity on a daily basis runs through the commercial networks, we, we are becoming more and more vulnerable because those commercial assets are part of national security. Our industrial base is part of national security in my realm. And I don't believe that we protect the rest of the federal government the same way we protect inside of DOD. So that's our challenge, and we're trying to bridge that gap and make that understanding more relevant. Well, again, thank you for being so proactive, and the uh, changes over the past year are, certainly are positive. Uh, our government continues to operate under a continuing resolution. The military services are taking risks to prevent capability gaps. How will a full-year continuing resolution impact U.S. Transportation Command's readiness? Are there cascading impacts to the service members or their families? Are we breaking faith with the service members and their families? Uh, Chairman, the, a continuing resolution is, is not good for anybody, really. Um, directly impacting U.S. Transportation Command, they're not as uh, prevalent as they are on the services. But that's a, a direct indirect on U.S. Transcom. So as the services individually take risks in their portfolio because of their lack of ability to plan or to program for different things, and they take risks in what they can, they can continue to operate, it disproportionately impacts the logistics and transportation communities. If a Marine decision is made to take a risk in logistics, if an Air Force makes a decision to take risks in logistics, and so on, all of those are compounded by the time they come to my joint command at U.S. Transportation Command. And what I've seen over the through sequestration and years of continuing resolutions, is that is starting to now um, hurt in ways in the services and now in my enterprise. Luckily, I have the Transportation Working Capital Fund that allows me to continue to operate, uh, but the resourcing, the ability to get after uh, how many C-5s we have available and flying, how many C-17s are in the active duty force, all of those are impactful now. Thank you very much. We now proceed to Congressman Courtney. Thank you, General. I'm just going to ask really one area and give some of the members a chance to jump in because I know we're going to have votes coming up pretty fast. So, uh, again, one of the your your command really is an interesting one because you kind of have your feet in a lot of different other agencies that fall outside of DOD. And um, you know, one of the issues that we have tried to work on on Sea Power over the last couple of years is really this workforce issue in terms of just making sure that we have merchant mariners. Um, ready to perform the mission that you um, quarterback. Uh, and obviously one of the big needs is uh, having training vessels uh, at the Maritime Academies. And again, that's not directly under your um, portfolio, but I, I just wonder if you could sort of, we, we put some authorizing money to jumpstart design and construction of some new vessels. And um, if you have any thoughts or perspective, we'd, 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 you know, that would be helpful in terms of trying to create a record uh, as we go into next year's NDAA. As you know, uh, uh, the Merchant Mariner Force is the bedrock to how we move the force in, in our country. Uh, it makes the difference between uh, us being the most powerful military in the world and us not being the most powerful military in the world. There are nations around the world that wish they had the power projection ability we have. The Mariner Force we have today is insufficient uh, to, to go to war for an extended period of time. We have got to continue to grow and nurture that seed corn that comes from the state military academies. I've met with many of them. I, I'm about to do another commissioning or a graduation speech and another one pretty soon. Some great Americans serving their nation in a powerful way, and we've got to give them better training tools, and we need to change it fast. Thank you. We now proceed to Chairman Rob Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General McDo, thanks again. Thanks so much for your service. I wanted to, uh, to talk about the um, well, for you to give us your perspective on, the first of all, the importance of the Ready Reserve Fleet. Secondly, today, is there the capacity there for a full mobilization, if necessary? And this other realm is if we lose a couple hundred additional merchant mariners, is the Ready Reserve Fleet even in a position to be able to begin an initial activation uh, for moving supplies and personnel to an engagement. So can you give, a, give us your perspective on that? 
Uh, thanks, Chairman. The Ready Reserve Fleet, about 61 strong ships, uh, is aging rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, we have ships as old as uh, 54 years in the fleet, and uh, the average age is somewhere around 39 years in this fleet. N not optimum. Uh, we're working very strongly with the United States Navy on a recap program that's going to be multifaceted. Uh, but to get to the core of your question, are we ready right now? Um, we have found some readiness cracks over the last uh, few months on being able to activate these ships and get them underway. We believe we have the numbers of ships to be able to start the initial um, deployment mm -hmm. and maybe the second round of deployments, but maybe beyond that, we're starting to be hurt by how available these ships will be and the capacity of the mariners. I think the first limb fact we'll have is the mariners will fall short of the mariners. Mm -hmm. So 11,280 by Marad is what we need. But that has some assumptions that all of those mariners will be available right when we need them. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's assumption we can, we can hold to. There are larger numbers of mariners out there, but the standards we put on them, we'd like our mariners to have at least 18 months of um, relatively current training before we put them on, on board to go to war. And so there's other things we've got to look at. The NDAA this past year uh, puts together a working group to get after the mariner question in more depth. U.S. Transportation Command will work with the Coast Guard and MARAD to get after those numbers and more. Mm -hmm. I want to look at a little bit now about uh, our airlift capacity. As you know, uh, you've been looking at what the increased demand signal will be for increasing the number of soldiers and Marines and the airlift capacity that goes along with that in having to move those individuals uh, to theaters if necessary. Uh, we know that the uh, Civil Reserve Air Fleet has a certain amount of capacity. We also know that uh, within the current lift capacity within the Air Force, uh, it, is, it has been uh, static at best. We know the C-17 line now is closed. Uh, we do know, though, that we have 27 C-5s in storage at the Aerospace Maintenance Regeneration Group out in Tucson. Uh, the question then becomes is looking at CRAF and looking at the current capacity with with airlift within uh, the Air Force and TRANSCOM assets. Uh, should TRANSCOM consider increasing the strategic lift capacity by returning the C-5 aircraft to service uh, through the C-5M model conversion program as we're, as we're upgrading or bringing those, those aircraft back in? Should that be something that we look at to make sure that going forward uh, we have, have that capacity? Uh, Chairman, uh, thanks for that question and the opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, airplane stuff, which I don't get a chance to talk to you about much <laughs> anymore. Um, our capacity on the lift side is uh, being challenged. Uh, as we drew back forces from overseas locations, I mean, when I was a youngster, um, there were 300,000 soldiers in Europe. Now there's about 60,000 soldiers in Europe. As I talked to General Scaparati, his concern is how, how we can get the forces to him in time. That primarily, without great indications and warnings, will be airlift and air refueling. So that's a concern. Um, I would first like to start with where the Air Force has taken risk in its portfolio today. So a couple years ago, the Air Force decided to put uh, two squadrons of C-17s in back of inventory, purely a fiscal decision, not because the airplanes weren't performing or the squadrons weren't performing, and took down two flags on active duty put them in backup inventory. We also put eight C C5s in backup inventory. What that has done is put us closer on the risk scale of what we can move when. The, the plan is for the Air Force to be able to afford to bring those, those airplanes back from backup inventory into primary inventory and put them in the Guard and Reserve. I, I love the Guard and Reserve. I'm a big, adv big advocate for the Guard and Reserve. But what we now have is a problem of balance. We now have so much assets in the Guard and Reserve because initially we thought it was going to be cheaper and that risk was more affordable there, but then it becomes a timing issue. Yeah. Those Guardsmen and Reservists aren't at their duty locations every single day ready to respond immediately. When they come up on, on duty 30 days in, I have great faith and confidence in their ability, but what can we do to hasten those airplanes being bought back in the primary inventory because we need those assets to get to a moderate level of risk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. And thank you, Chairman. And we now proceed to Congressman John Garamondi of California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, 
I, I guess I was surprised when I found my colleague and uh, chair of our, uh, uh, the Navy talking about the Air Force. So here I am. I'm going to talk about the Navy. So uh, let, let's go at that. Um, the Mariner issue has been some discussion. My apologies for having stepped step out. There was another general uh, who, Mr. Oliver, uh, General Oliver, who wanted to talk about some of the issues that are your turf also. Um, where to go here? Uh, in your written testimony, General, you talked about the problem of the Ready Reserve, the MSP, and the fact that we don't have, we will not have many mariners in another 10 years or even five years. Uh, and I, I understand in my absence, Mr. Courtney brought up the issue of training and the uh, training ships, all of which are important. But the fundamental problem is there won't be any place for these mariners to work. Uh, our, and I believe what some of the earlier discussion centered on the fact that our, merit, that our commercial maritime fleets all but disappeared. And so we may train people, but where are they going to work? Uh, and so what I want to really get into here is um, detailed on how, what your plans are to deal with the uh, Ready Reserve fleet and then the MSP fleet. The MSP, I believe, uh, there was a discussion earlier about the necessity of uh, the subsidy. I think we're in agreement on that. Whether there's money for it or not, that's another question. But nonetheless, that's not where I want to go. I want to go to the ships. And I want to, I want to hear your discussion about what to do with the ships uh, for the ready reserve. I notice that they are aged. So please, if you'll get into that in some detail with us. Uh, Congressman, the Ready Reserve Fleet is a vital part of our portfolio to be able to project the, to, a, a vital part of our portfolio to be able to project the Army, particularly to war. Uh, those 60 ships are the ones we have available, available initially to get moving. Uh, you are correct. We are having an issue with the, the maritime uh, community writ large, the lack of cargo. But if we get back to the reserve, Ready Reserve Fleet, we are working with the United States Navy to recapitalize that fleet that is averaging now 39 years of age. Some of them are as old as 54 years. We're starting to see cracks in their availability. When we activate those ships for readiness, they're not always getting underway. Now, right now, today, I've got five of those ships globally engaged, working fine. But we need more than just the five. And I'm sure we have more availability than just five, but we're finding that we don't have 100% availability of those ships. The recap of those ships will take a multifaceted solution. Rebuilding new ships is where we all want to go. That won't happen very, very quickly. I would guarantee that the CNO of the Navy probably doesn't want to put my sea lift ships at the top of his list when he's going to recap the Navy. I understand. So, but that's part of the portfolio. The other part is to see if we can service life extend some of our younger ships um, out uh, a few more years to bridge the gap. And I believe we ought to consider what we can do with some of the ships we're using every day in the maritime security program, those U.S. flagged ships with U.S. mariners that we're using every single day. Can we buy some of those used ships uh, and put them in the ready reserve fleet to augment that force? Some of those ships are available at 10 to 15 years of service, and we can use those for a number of years as a bridge. Uh, in doing so, we come up against what I think is a fundamental issue, and that is, are they American-built? And uh, this is something we're going to have to wrestle with as a team here, uh, and I think most of us are advocates of buy America, build America, and we may find that some of those ships that you want to buy may not be American-made. We need to work our way through that. I'm going to take my last 40 uh, seconds here to really uh, lobby my colleagues uh, here on the dais, um, we can expand the American maritime fleet, the, the commercial maritime fleet, by requiring that the export of oil and gas be on American-built ships. And we can start at 10, 15 percent and then ramp it up. That would give us an opportunity for mariners to be trained and ready for the Ready Reserve or the MSP. Uh, we can also build ships by requiring that those ships be American built. There's legislation to do this. This is part of what the subcommittee in the Transportation Coast Guard Maritime
committee is working on. So I'm going to lobby my members here uh, on that. But we really need detailed plans, General, from you on how you're going to transition this. It fits uh, directly with the work that we're doing over in the Transportation Committee. And it's possible. It's going to take some money. And frankly, it's going to take some of that 54 additional ships that the Navy wants uh, to, be, uh, the, to be this piece of it. With that, I'd best yield back because I'm 37 seconds over. Thank you, Congressman. We now proceed to Congressman Austin Scott of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, great to see you. I want to uh, reiterate the importance of uh, our Merchant Marines and the Merchant Marine Academy. Uh, whatever challenges we have there, we need to overcome those challenges and, and move forward. Those uh, young men and women there are a tremendous asset to the United States, and I know that you couldn't function uh, without them. Uh, I want to go back to what my friend Rob Whitman brought up on the, uh, the C-5s. I represent Robbins Air Force Base, obviously uh, one of the three Air Force depots. Uh, we, we do depot level maintenance on the C-5 Galaxy, the C-17 Globemaster for uh, the strategic airlift, the C-130 Hercules for tactical airlift. Uh, you say that we're seeing stress on the strategic airlift fleets uh, in your testimony. Would you please... Um, expound on these stresses and what the concerns are, and can you outline for me the plan for large airlift platforms like the C-5 uh, if we intend to bring them back? I'm, uh, and then one final question. I'm extremely concerned as we look at Europe uh, because we don't have, I mean, the rail system is not there to, to move forward. The gauges are different on, on rail. Do we have... Uh, the ability to land those C-5s in the areas that we would need to land them for um, any type of conflict in Europe? If I, if I step back for just a second, uh, Congressman, on your question, uh, it is a matter of capacity. So our strategic airlift capacity is what it is. It depends on what we'll ask the community to do and to what level of risk we're willing to assume. Uh, I can always tell you that I could use double the numbers of C-17s and C-5s that we have, but that may not be practical. One, we can't make any more uh, C-17s, and it may not be practical to bring all those airplanes back and modify them. But we may not need all of them if we manage the risk on the ones that we do have. Uh, I would say that the number of airplanes we have in the backup inventory um, and our plans to wait to bring them back on, on active inventory for a couple more years as the Air Force can afford them is one that puts us in greater risk than I believe we should take. And when we bring them back on active inventory, they, I believe they should go back to an active duty unit uh, and bring those airplanes back so that they're readily available more, uh, more quickly. As I talk to General Scaparotti about Europe and the problem set that he faces, uh, he will tell you that response quickly is going to be important. The rail gauge issue in Europe is a big one. Uh, most of our command spends time all around the globe every single day in looking at our master plan for access and points that we can use, ports, rail, and airfield all around the globe. So I believe we have some places in Europe we can go. Are there as many as we used to have? Probably not. Are we as practiced as at rolling through some places in Europe as we once were? Not again. But we're going after trying to exercise in a different way. General Scaparotti is leading that effort for Europe. Uh, but we're also working the other combatant commands for similar issues around the globe. As we've drawn back forces into the United States, how will we project power, how will we project aid, how will we can project our assistance to these nations that rely on us? General, if you, if you decided today, if, if we as a country decided today that we were going to bring back a squad of those C-17s, how long would it take to have that squad uh, the command and control of the squad, as well as the units ready to fly. Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak slightly out of my lane because I'm, although I'm wearing a nice looking blue uniform right now, I'm not in the Air Force this moment. And so I would have to defer a little bit to my air component. But I believe right now we have not fully drawn down those aviators in those active duty units that were just stood down about a year ago. They're slightly overmanned today, but we're going to slowly bring those down if we don't do something relatively quickly because that's what the budget will do. It will bring down to 100 percent manning. If we were act today, which I don't think we can, we can maybe salvage those crew members and not take them down 
and with a plan to bring them right back up with the, with the airplanes. So if we act today, it, it, it would not take that long to bring the units back? I, I don't believe so, and I don't want to speak too much out of turn because, like I said, but I believe right now those units, in Charleston in particular, are still overmanned uh, with C-17 crew members, uh, and we could probably bring those airplanes back out of back of inventory into primary inventory and use those, uh, those crew members to still man those airplanes. General, thank you for your service. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. My concern is if, if, if we do this in BCT numbers, if you take down a BCT, it takes a couple of months to take one down. It takes three years to bring it back. And that's my concern with the actions we're taking. With that, I yield the remainder of my time. And thank I'm not, you, Congressman. I'm not sure that the Air Force has the capacity to rapidly generate that many pilots right now anyway if we let them all go away. Thank you, Congressman. And we now proceed to Congresswoman Colleen Hanabusa of Hawaii. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, General, and thank you for acknowledging Vicki, who made my first transition here very easy. General, I want to talk, uh, I'm kind of following off from Congressman Garamendi, because one of the things that I'm interested in is the, is the, uh, the, the military sealift portion of it. I'm, I was interested in your testimony from pages 9 to 10, when you talked about the MSP program, and then you also spoke about the Jones Act, and you do say in your testimony that by um, subsidizing a robust domestic maritime industry, including U.S. industrial shipyard infrastructure for building, repairing, and overhauling U.S. vessels, and we are, of course, talking about in terms of the June Jones Act, that's the only requirement that we build America, and in addition, they also have to have the mariners staffing. So on the MSC, MSP program, you um, have about 60 U.S. flagged. Is that about correct? And we, uh, meaning Congress has authorized and the military subsidizes it, the program to the tune of about $186 million. We, of course, do not subsidize any Jones Act uh, carriers. First, tell me, are we... Um, is there a requirement that while they receive the subsidy that they be manned, quote unquote manned, not to be sexist, but manned with our mariners only? Yes. So they have our, our mariners, uh, but they are not built in the, in the U.S. Those ships are not required to be built in the U.S., but they have to be U.S. flagged right. and uh, U.S. mariners on board the ships when they carry our goods. So when we um, are looking at a situation like, uh, for example, we all can recognize that our shipbuilding industry depends too heavily on the military. And what we really would like to see is a robust commercial aspects of it. I'm sure my colleagues from San Diego and Norfolk would agree with me that what we don't have is that component with the MSP program. However, we do subsidize them, correct? I, I like to use the word stipend. Okay, so, so what is the stipend that they receive? Uh, they, they receive a stipend basically to stay with us. Uh, Congresswoman, as, as you may know, back in the, the 1950s, there were 1,500 ships <coughs> sailing under U.S. flag and international trade. It's a little before my time, but okay, I'll take your word for it. I, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> 1,500 ships, but today there are only 78 in U.S. international trade. We're still a maritime nation, from what I understand, but that's, that's the decline you're talking about. So how does the stipend work? So, what, I mean, what do they get the stipend for? They basically get the stipend to being available to move our goods and services uh, when we need them and to be ready to go to war when we need them. But they do not have to be actively engaged in any military activity at the point that they receive the stipend, though. No. So they can be moving commercial goods and receive the stipend? Yes. Okay. So we, and do you know on an average what the stipend is that we, we provide to the MSP program? And is it like per vessel, per route? How do you do it? It's per vessel. Okay. Um, it is currently 3.2 million per ship, 3.5 per ship. Is that uh, in a year? Per year. Per year. It is authorized up to 5 million. Um, and in the out years of the plan, it goes to 5.2, 5 I believe. So they could never move any military goods or services, whatever we may call upon them, and they will still receive that stipend per year? Theoretically, that could happen. Realistically, I can't imagine it happening. I use those ships daily. But it may not be the same ship. There's 60-some-odd number of them, correct? 
So Absolutely. you could be using one or two or whatever the number may be. I, I can get you the exact numbers, but we uh, have a robust use of those 60 ships. I, I would appreciate that. But isn't also a major component of it that they do not in any way compete with our domestic, quote, Jones Act ships? Isn't that a requirement under the law that established the MSP program? Um, I, I would have to double check that one. I, the Jones Act allows us to have additional uh, ships in U.S. trade with U.S. flag. It also provides additional mariners. So the Jones Act for me is part of the overall readiness of our maritime industry and our, our ability to go to war. I, I agree with that, General, but the Jones Act has that additional requirement that keeps our industrial base there, which your MSP program does not. So what I would like to know, if you would, is to provide me all that information. And I'd also like to understand, with the Chair's permission, how is it that we're subsidizing non-U.S. built ships and our U.S. built ships are the ones with all these additional constraints on, and it doesn't help my colleagues with the great um, shipbuilding yards in their neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. Thank you, Congresswoman. We now proceed to Congressman Bradley Byrne of Alabama. Good morning, General. We're pleased to have you here. Um, before I get started my questions, I want to let you know my Uncle Jack was a merchant marine officer during World War II. Tragically, he and all hands went down on his ship while they were performing a very important uh, task for the American military. So I'm always conscious of the fact that these mariners are not only performing an important task, they too are in harm's way, and I, I appreciate that. I want to talk to you about uh, the Expeditionary Fast Transport Vessel, the EPF. I was in Singapore last month and saw two of them at dock preparing to be loaded. I would like to know how you and Transcom are using those ships. They seem to be pretty good ships, seem to be utilized a lot. I'd just like to know in general how you're using them. Thanks, Congressman. First, for the Mariners, uh, during World War II, I believe they were one of the largest groups of losses that we had in any single grouping in World War II. I think some, some 9,000 plus uh, Mariners were, civilian Mariners were lost during, during the war. Uh, they are valiant uh, servants of this nation, and we can't do what we do in U.S. Transportation Command without those Mariners. Um, on on the, uh, the vessels that you just mentioned, they are underneath the United States Navy. I don't have direct access to those, uh, those ships, those vessels. Uh, our military sea lift command and through the U.S. Navy channels is how those will get used, but they're not part of the, the Transcom portfolio. And, and let me ask you once again to go over the continuing resolution. Um, I was listening very carefully to what you said because, you know, we're eminently going to have to make a decision about that. If you would uh, go down a little bit further in your testimony and tell us very precisely as succinctly as you can. If we adopted a continuing resolution in April, what would it do to you? And, and again, Congressman, the, um, directly um, because of the Transportation Working Capital Fund, which is a revolving fund that allows me to continue operating without, uh, basically allows me to continue operating year long because I have to be ahead of the fighting force. If you, we decided to deploy the fighting force, I can't wait for the, the money to move because I've got to move ahead of time. So directly, not that much of a direct impact on U.S. Transportation Command. Indirectly, if the CR causes the Air Force to stop flying, which I just read this morning, if the Air Force has to stop flying six weeks, the last six weeks of the quarter, that will impact my ability to maintain ready pilots and crews to man those ship, the, man the airplanes. And conversely, if the other services have to take risks in order because they don't have the money they thought they were going to have to have because a CR really is a budget cut. You're, you're planning on the money from last year, so it is in somewhat of a cut. So if you don't have that money available and you have to stop operating, then it starts to impact my ability to do my job. Well, I know you, that is, you said it's indirect, but it sure feels like it's direct <laughs> because it, 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 you're not able to carry out the function that you're supposed to be carrying out as a result of it. And, and, but only be, it, I only say it's indirect because I can't know how the services are going to take the risks when the CR comes on them. I can make assumptions that they might reduce this or reduce that, but until they actually get faced with it and make the actual decision, then it becomes my problem. Do you plan as if you're going to have those uh, planes at your disposal? Or, or do you plan, or do you have contingency plans if they're not there? 
Uh, my contingency plans are always being worked. Uh, that's the nature of the business we're in. We always have to plan. So that's why we have the civil side of our work. Um, if, you know, if I don't have the military side, I can, through the Civil Reserve Air Fleet, potentially get after some additional civilian aircraft to do that if we're in a permissive environment. If it's non-permissive, then the next step would be go to the Guard and Reserve. There's a lot of options we can take, but CRs can start to impact a lot of those things other than the civil sector. Well, I hope that we avoid that. I do too. For a lot of different <laughs> reasons. Uh, we appreciate what you do, and please let us know what we can do further to support your very important component of defending the United States of America. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman. We now proceed to Congressman Don McKeachin of Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, I am a uh, freshman, and so I'm trying to make sure I understand about all sorts of things and learn about all sorts of things. Can you help me understand to what extent Transcom is reliant on civilian facilities uh, and infrastructure? Broadly, uh, Congressman, and, and don't be reluctant to ask me really strange sounding questions. It is not a, a, a simple portfolio, although it seems to be simple on the surface. Um, we rely on just about everything uh, this nation has to offer when it comes to infrastructure. Civilian rail, trucking, uh, civilian air. So all of that infrastructure that would impact what most people would think would be the economic viability of a commercial company is actually part of national security and, in, for my case, national defense and our ability to project power in war. We can't move an Army unit. We can't move um, <coughs> um, Marines or anything through this country without using some commercial port, some commercial rail, or some commercial trucking company. Well, this, this then may be a difficult question for you to answer, uh, but perhaps not. Do you see any significant investments in civilian infrastructure that's needed uh, to help you complete your mission? We always need uh, improvements in uh, rail, uh, road, seaports. We're always working with commercial entities <coughs> to ensure that the latest technology is incorporated, that cyber defenses are incorporated in these. My, my request, if I could make one of you, is Anytime you're looking at improving or changing something in the commercial industry, think about the impact of national security. For me, it's national security. Most agencies don't think of all of those mom and pop trucking companies as potentially being something that may take our nation to war. That, that's the way I view it, Congressman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much, Congressman. We proceed to Congressman Duncan Hunter of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, good to see you. I remember in 2000, uh, 2004 when I deployed, I was the embarkation officer and dropped off our artillery pieces on a row row in San Diego, which met us in Kuwait, which we then went up into Iraq with. So I've got a on the ground in, in, in touch with this. I guess my first question is, um, if you had to do North Korea and Russia at the same time, do you have enough ships? Pretty easy. No. No. <laughs> okay. How short would you be? Uh, it, it depends. We really have to take a look at the actual scenario and what, what effects you would have to try to make and in what timing. If it's completely simultaneously, I don't know if there's enough ships in the world, um, but depending on what effects at what time uh, scale and what the tip fit would have to go through, um, we'd have to see. And I can get the analysis folks to take a look at it, and I'm sure we can come up with that number. And if you just had to do one of them and you, um, you, you calculate attrition, what is the attrition rate that you calculate? Let's just I, take Korea because they're being crazy. I, I'm ashamed to say, uh, up until recently, we didn't account for attrition. We, so we assumed. You assumed that all, none of the ships would get sunk. We have Lord never. Course. We have never battled lack of domain dominance in for this nation in 70 plus years. We're we're there now. We're we're in a different mindset today. We're looking at a different enemy, a different fight. Uh, we have to think differently. We're now incorporating attrition, but not before now. So when you, when you look at the Ready Reserve Fleet and the MSP, is attrition going to be built into your next recommendation to Congress of what we authorize and appropriate for those ships? It has to be. 
Okay. It doesn't necessarily have so to I'm be I'm assuming your numbers are, are going to go up. Uh, well, it also has to mean we have to change our tactics, techniques, and procedures. Not everything is an increase in numbers. Sometimes it's just how we employ, how we deploy. Uh, the fact that you still remember how to, to put some stuff on a ship. Not, like not how. I'd like to bring you back as a G4 of a unit. I just, we I just sat there while that. my Marines did it. I, I did. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, but, uh. but we don't have actually many people left in the military who remember what it was like to actually deploy. What we've been in for the last 15, 16 years is sustainment. That's a completely different proposition. Um, second question, totally different thing. What, what ability do you have to bring life support in, in big amounts, giant, massive quantities of life support or ammo, let's just call it a ammo, life support, beans, bandage, bullets, is, bullets um, to a, if you don't have a port and you don't have an airstrip? Uh, we are challenged if you don't have a port or an airstrip. There, there is always airdrop. There's ability to get in behind lines, but we've got to look at the contested environment and the ability for the enemy to deny us that, uh, the ability to get in there. If we don't have air superiority, we don't have a lot of things. And so um, I, I rely on that still being a fact, but if it isn't, we start to look at different ways to bring problems to bear and bring solutions to bear. Uh, another piece, you talked about bringing medical evacuation. That's another part of my portfolio that has been under, underrepresented, probably by me as well, in understanding the impact of our ability to evacuate large numbers of people from a hostile zone. Uh, so we're looking at all those things, and I believe we have plans that take care of some of them, but this anti-access uh, denial by an, an adversary is new for all of us, and we have to think differently. I, I would just throw out there, there's a thing called the Eros craft. The ability, I mean, this, this, it's a giant blimp, basically, that can hold three or four tanks, can hold a lot of supplies and stuff, and they can just drop in. If you have air superiority, obviously, a floating airship is easy to shoot down, right? Yeah, <laughs> otherwise they call those targets. Right. Um, <laughs> last, last thing, do you think, would you say there's anything more important than the Jones Act for the maritime industrial base? In, in U.S. law at, at all? There are several pieces of U.S. law that are, that are part of the industrial base, and it's not just one. The Jones Act is probably the anchor for it, but without the Jones Act, without the uh, maritime security program, without cargo preference, our maritime industry is in jeopardy, and our ability to project the force is in jeopardy. If we think we need to project our force with U.S. flagged vessels, with U.S. mariners on board, we need all of those things right now to secure that. And, and your, your uh, stipend, you said, is like 3.2 million right now for MSP. We've authorized and appropriated five, 5 million. We, 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 we've upped that. If these U.S. flag vessels were not doing commercial work at all, they were just sitting there, what, what would the stipend have to be? Uh, it, it, you, could, you could debate the number a little bit, but it would be upwards of it, seven, eight to $10 million a year. If they just sat there? Yeah. Okay. But the, uh, thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Congressman. We'll now proceed to Congressman Don Norcross of New Jersey. Thank you, Chairman. General, thank you for being here today and very sobering. Uh, the things that appear not to be immediately in front of us tend to fall off the edges, whether it's deferred maintenance or building our transportation. But as we all know, we're only as strong as our weak, weakest link. What area in your portfolio keeps you up at night? Air refueling tankers. And that doesn't get better for another three years at the earliest? At, at the earliest. Um, if we had a thousand air refueling tankers, it might be enough. But if you look about any contingency around the world, so you pick a spot in the world and you bring up any kind of uh, issue. If you had a simultaneous or even a competing uh, regard anywhere else in the world, your tanker ute rate goes up to a place that I can't even, that I can imagine, but the numbers are daunting. Because any significant battle also brings up the rate of defense of the homeland, um, and any corresponding co COCOM near that area has to bring up their defenses. All of that needs air fuel and tankers. So when your recommendations go in, as you heard earlier for the NDAA, is that your largest and most focused request? Um, it would be 1A. One would be getting back the C5s off back of inventory into active inventory. Uh, 1A would be 
accelerating the tanker program as best we can and taking us out of the risk bathtub we've been in for a while on tankers. We made some of it intentionally, uh, but now we, we've got to climb our way out. We've read recently where that might be even pushed back a little further due to a number of technical issues in the uh, production line. When is the earliest, given what you've seen, you think the first one will be delivered? I, I wish I could really tell you. There's a projection by uh, the manufacturer, uh, and there's a projection by the United States Air Force, and they are not the same projections right now. And I would hate to speculate on between the two of them. The Air Force is primarily working with Boeing uh, to make sure that that is as quick as they can make it. What's plan B? There are some programming actions out there in a plan B that we're probably not going to be able to execute. You know, right now, the plan to retire the KC-10s may have to be revisited, although I understand the expense that's going to come with trying to keep the KC-10s around longer than the plan. Uh, but we, we have to find a way to climb out of the bathtub if the KC-46 is not going to be online in a reasonable amount of time to allow us to potentially accelerate that, that recap. And at 12 aircraft per year, that's going to take a long time. We built 700 of them in seven years in the 60s, and we're looking to recap them at 12 a year. So let me understand this. Your biggest concern are the refuelers, and yet we're not making a decision to keep them active enough to take that risk off your plate? Uh, the decision is there for the next few years. The retirement, I can't, I don't recall, that, and I'll get you the exact date that the Air Force plans to retire the KC-10, but it was also based on bringing the KC-46 on. So I, it may be shifting as we speak. I just don't want to speak for the Air Force right now on that particular issue because those negotiations are going on almost minute by minute. Very sobering. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Congresswoman. We now proceed to Congresswoman Martha McSally of Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for your testimony and your service. Uh, General McDude, it's good to see you. Um, we've moved a lot of assets out of the European theater over the last years, uh, thinking that uh, there is a lasting peace there uh, to include uh, A-10s and other fighters and, uh, and Army units. And now, as part of the European Reassurance Initiative, we are deploying them back. Uh, on a rotational um, uh, manner. So uh, my concern is, with the strains that you've uh, talked about today, what uh, tax does that have on Transcom uh, to be continuously deploying units to meet the requirements for security and reassurance and dealing with Russian aggression in Europe? Uh, you know, I think we really need to, and this is really more the services, do a cost-benefit analysis here, but I just want to know, have you quantified that tax both on tankers and cargo to be constantly moving units back and forth now versus having them stationed there? Um. Congresswoman McSally, well, first of all, it's good to see you again. You may not remember having met me 20-some-odd uh, years ago, but Lieutenant McSally, uh -oh. <laughs> um, when, when you were first selected to go fly combat aircraft, there was a young captain in the Pentagon who researched all the women who could have actually selected combat aircraft if it had been made available to them at the time. It was Captain Darren McDew that actually did some of that research back in the day, so it's good to see you where good you are now. Good to see you again, too. Uh, great. <laughs> so some of that tax is not necessarily a tax. Um, one of the things that we've realized that we've been in 15 years of sustainment, and so some of it we need to exercise the muscle again. And, and as long as these rotations are planned and scheduled, it's not that bad, and it's actually not, it's actually good. We have forgotten units how to move themselves from Alaska through the continent of the United States to a port, get on a ship, and move to Europe or the Pacific. That, that muscle memory is a, is a good exercise for the Army. It's not a bad one for the enterprise of ours. We recently tried one of those and blew a bunch of tires on a bunch of striker vehicles because of things that we had forgotten how to do. So not all of it is a bad tax. What's bad for us if it's emergent, not planned? like say for a real war contingency. Or if another contingency emerges, right? right? In a resource constrained environment, what's, you know, that may be nice to do, but there's a cost with that as well, right? I mean, have you, have you captured what that cost is of the rotation versus what it would be steady state if, if we weren't doing that? 
Not really, because that would take us assuming what level of presence the Army or the Department of Defense would like to have in Europe. Yeah. You know, would it be the 300,000 plus we used to have? Would it be something short of that? Given those assumptions, we could probably make that, make that calculation fairly easily. Great. Thank you. I know uh, votes are being called, so I'll yield back. Thanks, sir. Good to see you again. Thank you, Congresswoman. We now proceed to Congresswoman Vicki Hartzler of Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, General, for all that you do. I uh, wanted to hone in just a little bit on the rail situation. I've heard some concerns from some other uh, commanders and National Guard units and, and such from my district who were over there in the, in the Baltics, and they were explaining the difficulty with the, the different rail gauges. Uh, can you address um, what steps are being taken to, to uh, rectify this situation? Congresswoman, one of the first things we're doing is realizing that the problem is a problem. Okay. Uh, so we haven't been in Europe in this, this manner in a while. And so it's realizing, we know that the rail gauges are different, but what has transpired in Europe has uh, been similar to what's transpired in, in other places around the world. If you don't use it for a while, you've got to go back and figure out how to use it again and how it's being used, i.e. what's being contracted out, what's owned by the government of the nation that we're trying to go through, what are the what are the ways to connect those, those dots? That's what we're trying to relearn. The rail gauge issue has been around for a long time, but we had enough people there before and we had enough access and we had enough kind of muscle memory that it wasn't as big a problem as when you're trying to start all over again. How does that tactically work uh, now? What, what plan do you anticipate doing? Uh, just getting to the border and, and unloading and putting it on their uh, rail cars that do match, or are we looking at um, changing the types of rail cars that have, uh, you know, perhaps a movable uh, gauge capability? I, I don't know, but how are you going to address this? We're not there with the movable, movable rail gauge, but maybe I can have my team start to work on that one. We'd have to transload uh, onto rail cars that would be available to move on that rail gauge. Um, and we, we have contingency plans for that, but we've got to go back and look at it again. One of the things um, that we're starting to realize, not starting to realize, we had all these management headquarters cuts. And, and I understand efficiency, I understand budgets and all that stuff, but what's happened is our ability to think, our ability to project different, that to, to go after those problem sets is starting to slow down. So we can identify the problem. It takes us a while to get to that one as we're addressing all the myriad of problems we have. And so my, my request is the other thing is as we cut all the commands and we brought down their, their, um, their manpower, where did they make those cuts? I would guarantee you not many of them tried to salvage their logistics, transportation <laughs> sure. planners. And so what I'm finding is I'm trying to help all those other combatant commands try to get after these problem sets, too. Very good. Just a quick question about the last tactical mile. It's uh, my understanding that DOD has not incorporated those distribution metrics in, into their plan, um, and it's the responsibility of the distribution process owner to oversee the overall effectiveness. Uh, uh, so what progress is U.S. Transcom making in working with the combatant commands to routinely collect distribution performance information for the last tactical mile? Well, I'm, I'm thankful that the combatant commands are thinking differently than when TRANSCOM was given that moniker of the distribution process owner. When TRANSCOM was first given that moniker of the distribution process owner, not everybody was happy about it. And the reason the word is owner and not commander or director is because they wanted TRANSCOM to have less power in some of those areas to make decisions. Today, moving forward, all the combatant commands understand how much we need a global person to look at transportation writ large. At the last distribution process owner executive board, I let the team know of all the people represented that we're going to make some decisions now about a number of things, and many of them are welcoming Transcom's role to look more deeply at the end-to-end -end solution. That wasn't there a few a decade ago when we got this decision. You bet. Thank you very much. I'll yield back for time. Thank you, Congresswoman. We now be concluding with Congresswoman Elise Stefanik of New York. 
Thank you, Chairman Wilson, and thank you, General McDo, for your service and for your testimony today. In your testimony, you discussed how our enemies continue to use our dependence on the cyber domain against us, and that the greatest challenge for Transcom is the threat of an attack in the cyber domain. Uh, obviously, we have some unique challenges in cyber, especially when compared to the rest of the DOD. Can you describe some of the ongoing activities uh, related to cyber, and then specifically, how are you working with Cyber Command to better protect your networks? Congresswoman, uh, our networks are fairly well defended. Cybercom, I have great confidence in what they're doing to protect our networks. It is the rest of my network that I'm most concerned about, is the part outside the Department of Defense network. Uh, I extend throughout the entire country and around the world. Most of it on the commercial dot-com networks is where I have to do my business. If a combatant command were to give me all their best secret information, I've then still got to contract it out. And right now, that chasm between uh, DOD and DHS and how we think about cyber and what authorities we have to bridge that gap are my most uh, relevant concern. Um, and then just uh, quickly before uh, I have to run to votes, I want to ask specifically what the impact of a CR would be on your cyber efforts. Uh, similar to Mr. Burns' questions, this is an issue that we are going to continue grappling with, and we know that CRs are devastating to DOD, but I'm asking specifically when it comes to cyber. Well, that would be a direct impact on our cyber protection force, that Cyber Command puts a force against uh, protecting our networks. Uh, the training and resourcing of that team would slow down, probably, and the training would be impacted. Uh, I would imagine that would eventually get to maybe less defending of our network, but I would hope that they'd find a way to get around it. Thank you. I yield back. And thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman Stefanik. And, General, thank you very much for being here, and we are in the midst of votes. But uh, I, I'm just so grateful for the members who have taken time to stay the entire time of uh, their dedication and appreciation of your service. We are adjourned. <laughs>